three eminent uh, uh, intellectuals from uh, Europe. <coughs> and um, our public is not big but high quality. So um, I'm proud of this too. And um, uh, a phenomenon which I think is not enough uh, reflected at least in Western European public spheres. That is this strange um, sympathy uh, um, for the devil, sympathy for Putin, this pro-Putinism, uh, Russia-philia, Putinophilia, we, we can, can try to define um, uh, how, how we call this phenomenon. And um, we, our starting point uh, will be a text uh, which uh, was published, a text by Yoko Prochasko, uh, which was uh, published by, um, in the Süddeutsche Zeitung, and was a speech um, he held in Vienna. Um, our other participants in the debate are Joko Prokasko, is, uh, you, you, everybody uh, knows him, translator and essayist and author from the Ukraine. Tony uh, Kersen Price is author, economist, uh, was uh, long, for long years uh, editor-in-chief of a very important um, online magazine which is called Open Democracy. Um, and uh, he's still author at uh, Open Democracy. And uh, Slavomir Sierakovsky is uh, one of the most uh, important young uh, Polish intellectuals. He has already, uh, um, there are so many initiatives on, on, on his, um, uh, in, in his life that's uh, difficult uh, to tell them all, but he's founder of a um, magazine, I think, uh, which is called um, Polish, Crit Polish Critique, is, is yeah. that right? Mm -hmm. and um, uh, is also a founder of a network of intellectuals, of cultural house, and uh, an important uh, sociologist who uh, had, for example, uh, or still have um, uh, a column in the New York Times uh, where you write about Poland uh, for the most part. Um, so, Yoko, you... Um, wrote uh, some uh, month ago uh, a remarkable essay about Putin's sirens. You um, uh, asked yourself um, how, how does it come that, um, uh, that, excuse me, I am looking for the text, um, that um, such such a big part of Western public sphere uh, has this uh, strange sympathy for Putin, is defending Putin's position, and this um, phenomenon is not a phenomenon, you don't describe it as a phenomenon of right-wing or left-wing people, because uh, it exists in every part of, of the political uh, spectre, I would say, in, in the European, in West, Western Europe. And uh, you speak, and for that I have to uh, look for your text. Um, you, uh, I, I will read a little bit of this text because um, it um, describes rather uh, in, in an interesting way this phenomenon or this uh, pathology. You ask, where does this uh, masochistic pleasure uh, in self-flagellation come from? The pleasure, the pleasure of humiliation, does it stem from lying? Putin's sirens sing a song based on counterpoint. It affects two otherwise incompatible uh, groups of re recipients. I would call them, first, the group of fear, and second, the group of resentment. The first one suffers from Stockholm syndrome and identifies with the aggressor. This, uh, they... Uh, would welcome anything just to avoid another bigger war and would happily sacrifice smaller countries such as, as uh, Georgia or Ukraine just to maintain their prosperity. They are prepared to accept the perpetrator's uh, demands as justifiable, show understanding for historical reasons, so-called historical reasons, and regard the victim as a perpetrator or target of a deserved punishment. The others, 
whom I call the group of resentment, follows Putin out of a self-pitying an anger at their own governments, or because it is a way of reinforcing uh, their own extremism and populism. Putin's faithful followers include the supporters of the Front National in France, Jobbik, Jobbik in Hungary, and Golden Dawn in Greece. Um, you, I, I suppose you thought very much about this subject because it's also an old phenomenon. This Varsafilia is not uh, new as phenomenon. It's not linked to Putin. So what are the deeper reasons? Can you a little bit draft uh, your di ideas about that? Danke, Thierry. Uh, schön gut. Thank you, Thierry. My English is not so good that I could speak on it in a very a profound way. English is not my mother tongue, so I really prefer to speak my mother tongue. Now, Putin's sirens. It's um, a picture which I see in my memory, not because the sirens is something you link with acoustics. When you hear the word siren, you usually imagine some singing of the sirens which try to lure you, to attract you, to seduce you. I read an early version of this siren myth, more archaic versions, which are far more interesting, because in these very old versions of the siren myth, it is not the acoustic impre impression which plays a role. It's a visual impact which plays a role. In the original archaic versions of Greek myth, sirens were figures were myths which first have made a optical illusion uh, of coherent, consistent, dangerous level of the sea where uh, which is, I mean, the sea level was calm without any risk. So the first image was that you can f you can um, sail without a risk on the sea. Only later, the myth was also added, the soundtrack. And we see that the sailors, we see that the sailors think that they may continue sailing in peace because what they see is a calm sea, but they come then to some rocks and they may wreck, uh, but they don't see it. But uh, there is nothing, let's say, decisive in this. What we see is a concert of several points which will cause this effect. It is not something singular you could attribute the con uh, result to. And if we skip a part of it or don't understand it, then we don't understand the whole picture. And a uh, premise is also ideological mimickers. These messages coming out from Kremlin imitate something which doesn't exist. They imitate an ideology which is comprehensive, which is coherent, which is in one line. So it creates an impression that you are moving in a safe ideological field and that you may rely on it. And that's the first point. That would be the first premise for this. And the second uh, premise is that this propaganda is linked to very high ideal ideals and very primitive archaic contents in a very intelligent way. 
and all this is in mutual harmony. These ideals are changing, and when you look at it in today and then five minutes later, you see such differences that you really must understand that there is no original ideology, but what you see is only an imitation, an imitation of ideology and also of world on Chaung. So you, it is not about somebody trying to establish something for you. You get only an image which looks as a possible alternative and you can understand it only based on the circumstances of our world today, our complicated world where the facade, the face try, starts to crack and is in crisis because the old basic model has come to its end. Liberal democracy has arrived to its end and the solution which proved well in the past and worked are not good enough anymore. Using Bauman's words, I could say that politics is not a part of the power and politics is not done by the states, but it is done or directed by invisible forces. And then there is another aspect. Putin's propaganda works very intensely and subcutaneously with uh, different conspiracy theories, conspiracies against the world, etc. And this Putin's propaganda tries to uh, tell us, you don't understand it, you don't see the whole scope of this manipulation, of this disaster, but we are those who already understood. And we speak to, uh, to you from the position of a stronger, but one day you will also find out and see. And another point, which I consider very important, and it's one of the crucial of central points, and that's It's a total aspect, a total picture, which you see in connection with mimickers. All systems which existed so far, all usual systems so far, have arrived to their end. And this ideology has a incredibly destructible destructive power and said that we all must work to together that these old uh, systems, power systems, which are important now, which have come to the end, that we destroy them. This is what we show you. We are giving you an alternative. I even don't want to, uh, to name this alternative, illiberal democracy of a charismatic authoritarian regime or a new type of imperialism. I think it's not important to give a name to the alternative because I think that the creators of the propaganda don't have a name yet. But what is important is this uh, suggestive power saying that there is an alternative, but the method is such that you are not giving name to it. It's a part of the method. And then, then this central element, how all this is played. In my eyes, it's a contrapunct um, uh, uh, image, not like Said suggests, where he speaks about imperial colonial links uh, of culture, which should be analyzed. No, it's a contrapunct of a different type where this uh, counterpoint, where these uh, are celebrated and the gr groups of recipients are addressed at the same time and otherwise you would not be able to address them at the same time. And, uh, 
it is possible only now because otherwise these groups would want always something different. One group is a group of fear, a group which defends against fear. They want to keep their status quo forever because any change of their status quo causes them a lot of uh, anxiety. And this is a group which wants to avoid fear anxiety, and they do everything to prevent changes of the status quo. And that is what this propaganda does, because it uh, suggests them the idea that what can come can be even worse. And this is this perfidiousness uh, in this addressing of two groups at the same time. And I think it's also an explanation of this effect which said that at the same time you address another group, a group which has a lot of resistance, a group which doesn't want anything else but change the existing status quo, to shake the status quo. And you see many groups which are allies of Putin in the West, groups which are really interested in disrupting the existing system, and it doesn't matter whether they are left or right or wing-oriented, everything there is based on these destructive, disruptive desires and wishes. Britain and I suppose so in uh, the United States. Um, and you are yourself, as you say, a political activist, Perhaps of the non-dogmatic left wing, I would say. No, is it? Is is it? Uh, it's a good description. Uh, uh, non, I, I guess so. Yes. I, I'm happy so. To say that. <laughs> um, With so. On non <laughs> and I know that uh, open democracy is uh, an institute which is uh, uh, on on the one hand. Uh, left wing, I would say, but on the other hand, very crit critical with uh, Russia also. That's not typical, I would, um, or not always typical in, in the Western public spheres. So how, and um, I, I would like also, uh, I would like you to co comment, for example, a figure like uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who uh, not only is himself rather Putinophile, but um, who engaged uh, um, person with a rather Harry Potter-like uh, name, Seumas Milne, yes, uh, who is, um, who is uh, his uh, communications person now, and who is a former uh, author of The Guardian, <coughs> who is extremely pro-Putin uh, uh, um, uh, in this phase of uh, the Crimea uh, annexation, who defended um, this annexation who said uh, the West, uh, it was the West's fault that Putin was um, be forced to, to uh, do this uh, thing. So he's uh, one of these figures uh, who um, represent a little bit on the left wing side. Um, uh, one of these uh, discourses uh, which uh, Yoko uh, described, perhaps in this case, I don't know, is, this, is it the status quo side of those who don't want to change the relations to Russia? Or is it the resentment uh, side of those who want to change uh, radically uh, the Western systems? So how do you, um, how do you uh, see these uh, discussions in Great Britain and uh, in the English-speaking public sphere? Um, hello, it's very great. It's great to be here. Um, and uh, that's a difficult question. Let me, um, so I, uh, let, let me start with a few words on Corbyn. So uh, what I think is, and, and, and this is maybe somewhere where I'd like to make some distinctions in what we heard from Yoko. Um, uh, the way I see Corbyn is that there was a great uh, 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 popular, maybe not populist, popular uh, energy that went into his election. It, was, it sort of lit a fuse, it was an explosion. And it happened to be that the cannonball in the cannon at that time uh, is a hangover from the 70s and 80s. Uh, someone who hasn't, you know, uh, possibly hasn't moved on. Um, and I think that a lot of the things that we see, 
are you know, relate back to that world and to that view of the world and to the battles that were being fought at that time. In the 70s and 80s. In the 70s the and 80s. And the, it, is a, it, it, it is a, there is a, there is a, there is a, there is a, a we, we're still living with that remnant of the Cold War uh, in some of our commentators and in some of our, uh, and in some political generations. Um, now, and, you know, in, in that sense, they are, um, they have all the wrong reflexes and they're fighting, uh, they're fighting old battles. But I would like to firstly express some support for the explosion rather than the cannonball. So uh, the energy, the democratic energy, um, put itself, uh, uh, spoke of an ideal. And it seems to me that if we think about the sirens, um, the sirens may be, as you represent them, a mirage. But the sirens are also an ideal. And so Odysseus straps himself to the mast. He doesn't want not to hear them because, because the ideal will take him. It will take him to Ithaca, right? It's the, it's the imagination of something better that takes you somewhere. And indeed, it was uh, the imagination of something better which was so inspiring in the Maidan protests. And I think that it's, you know, I, w what, I, what I want to resist, all the while criticizing Milne, Corbyn, saying to them, you know, <laughs> drop that script, those battles are over. What I, what I want to resist is killing the ideal. Because if we kill the ideal, it seems to me that what we're saying to people and what we're saying to uh, young Ukrainians, what we're saying to Europeans all over Europe is, look, liberal democracy, the liberal democracy w we have, the here and now, that's as good as it gets. And if that's as good as it gets, it's so very, very a, easy. You have a sort of goodwill. You say that uh, uh, Corbyn or Seamus uh, Milne, they... Um, have misunderstood uh, something, they are um, caught in old patterns, and, uh, but um, you have to have um, sort, sort of um, respect for them or sort of reserve for, for them because they are acting in, a, in an authentic uh, will to, to act for, uh, for an ideal? Uh, no, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I, look, I don't know Corbyn's, um, uh, I, I know what Corbyn has said privately. I, I think that's true of the uh, democratic energies that elected Corbyn. I don't know about Corbyn, and I hope that he will, um, that he will be imprinted by those who elected him rather than, shape, r rather than the other way around. Um, I do think that it's an important part of uh, of the ideal we're building of, uh, of criticism, of enlightenment, of doing better than what we have. To be very clear that in most times, uh, there are no subjects that are taboo. So I, I, I went, I, I had a look at, I, you know, I, I have to admit I don't follow this, uh, uh, Corbyn's pronouncements on Ukraine hugely carefully. But I did go back and I looked at, the, at, 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 at this little exchange. So, um, and this is to say maybe that what I think is that there is a danger here of repolarization. And the danger of repolarization is that we actually lose what we gained from the end of Cold War. So um, Ed Lucas, for whom I have a great deal of respect, um, but who I think is also on the other side still fighting a Cold War, said this about, about Corbyn in an article in the Daily Telegraph. He said, to be fair, Mr. Corbyn's views taken singly are defensible. Okay, so he's saying, I don't want to have an argument in the details on the facts. But he goes on to say, but he has a blind spot when it comes to Russia. So he, in fact, says, look, 
uh, serious people espouse the same views. In this particular case, he referenced Kissinger. But I'm not going to argue for this particular case. I'm going to, in general, indict the person. Now, OK, um, that, in a sense, is, it seems to me, returning to tactics of war. Now, Ed happens to think that that's the state we're in or the state we're close to being in. But we have to decide if we're, if we're not at war. This was, I, I came into the end of the session yesterday where this was the central question. If we're not, then we should talk about the specifics. We shouldn't, we shouldn't say, oh, individually I'm happy to talk about this, but you're wrong. You have to say, okay, here's how you're wrong, why you're wrong. And, uh, you know, I think that the danger of polarize, it takes two to polarize. Okay. Um, Slavomir, um, you also wrote about this phenomenon uh, in, in the New York Times. Uh, there was an article about uh, the Putin's uh, youthful uh, idiots. Um, I would like uh, to, I would like you, if you, if you, if you would like to, uh, to, that you speak about. Described, um, but I would go deeper because I think there, there's, there are also some social reasons. Under the political surface, something happened with Western societies through last decades that makes us much weaker when it comes to different dangers to our democracy. Um, actually, I don't see much difference between, uh, you know, Islamist terrorists and Putinist terrorists, okay? If you feel, if you read Welbeck book, how easy Islamism is like, uh, uh, Yurko would say, the, 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 which means, uh, like taking into control or influencing uh, weak liberal democracies, it's pretty the same thing, you know. And something, you know, the individualization, this like disenchantment of the Western societies, this atomized Western societies, something which in different actually dictionaries is described in the same way. Conservatives would say the lack of commun community thinking then liberals would say the lack of social capital or the diminishing social capital. Then the leftists would say the lack of social engagement. Uh, all of it, you know, um, makes us uh, makes makes us really something that Peter Slaughter I called. And it, it's a kind of a enlightened cynicism. Okay, so enlightenment won and lost in the same time. Like b before, we thought that we make mistakes because we don't know enough. Now we know enough and we still do the mistakes, okay? This is, the, this is a problem, okay? So even if we know that Russia is this and that, we still do it, okay? And, uh, and the problem is that uh, it's very hard to, to struggle with this and it's hard for everybody. It's hard for politicians, it's hard for the supporters of civil society. And also, like, people are very disappointed with their political classes. In the globalized economy, the not globalized politics leaves you a very small and still, you know, decreasing field of maneuver. So if you don't trust your political class, then someone like Putin, who looks like a guy who at least controls everything, who gives kind of a, a you know, at least the illusion of security to their own citizens. We would like our politicians be so tough as, as Putin is. Before they were also tough, okay? And now they're like, you know, weak, very flexible, too flexible cynics, okay? So Putin is pretty attractive person in this, you know, uh, in, this, uh, in this spectrum of possibilities. So, so this is, th these are, I think, much, and the problem is that it's much harder to struggle with this social metrics that the politics is based on. And, um, and yeah, so maybe we should like also talk more, less like politologists and more like sociologists, not only because it's my profession, but it's because it's, it may yeah. add something to the discussions that are already engaged, um, advanced. I think Tony has a, 
something to say? Yeah, no, I'd, I, 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 I'd like to agree with, um, with, with the importance of identifying, mm -hmm. as it were, the root, uh, the root causes here. And it seems to me that um, in the identification of the root causes in the um, uh, atomization, one might even say marketization, of the uh, of, of of society, the uh, I'd like to take it back to the sirens. That um, this is the place precisely where the lack of a vision for the future. We want, you know, we 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 as humans want something uh, beyond the individual and beyond ourselves. And in that sense, don't you think that we ought to be separating? in these populisms, the good from the bad. Isn't that the only way in which we're going to protect the kind of society that we want? And look at, look at this, like, if something is really uh, um, uh, dangerous or something is really uh, problematic in this Welbeck novel, sub, you know, Soumission, this, this is not that the, there, are, there are so many Islamist citizens voting for Islamist power, Everybody, it's so like the al almost of everybody. The others. Exactly. So yeah. you know, like you know, translated to the Putinism, and you're gonna be surprised how many regular voters, or, of or earlier or voters that used to vote for regular parties now would vote for some. Like the actually, the the sort of a vote for Front National is not very different than the support for Putin. Okay, so voters are similar. Not only politicians are in alliance with Putin, and this is much more dangerous. Yoko, is it uh, is it uh, only this, uh, let's say, search for an easy recipe, which makes uh, the Western uh, ah so you can, uh, you can uh, which makes uh, the, the Western public uh, as fears. Um, uh, longing uh, to, to, to a figure like um, uh, uh, Putin or perhaps other figures of otherness, which also can be uh, projection figures like Islam, for example. Long time it was the third world uh, f from which um, uh, the Western societies or Western intellectuals um, hoped uh, to, to, to get mm. uh, a solution to their problem with themselves. Uh, before that it was a proletariat. And um, so there's always a, a blonde hero, and um, now uh, it seems to be, if it's not uh, Putin, it is Islam or Islamism. Um, is it really so that you spoke about uh, something beyond that? Um, is it really so that uh, Western societies, in a way, can't live without that, these sort of projections of otherness to define themselves? Is it uh, necessary in established democracies? Ja, das mag sehr gut sein. Es mag Demokratia. Ja, so this idea that nobody has a right or nobody has truth, and there is no truth, that truth is only a sum, not a sum, a result of issues which you may negotiate. This incredible tendency we see in the West in the last decade, and I'm not saying that it's only this, You could also call it maybe postmodern. I am not really a friend of such explanations or names, but this idea and this very deep mistrust in what is so obvious, and that is that the West Uh, that Western societies were influenced by this very significantly, and despite obvious things, we see a deeply socialized attitude. We cannot accept it as an obvious truth. There must be something more. We must still discuss about it. I am not an enemy of reflection, criticism, doubts. Please don't uh, misunderstand me. But I'm saying it because I 
I see something else which motivates me and not uh, only to see a new exegesis, but also to see all the old ideas. Everything seems to be very weak, and there is disillusion. Maybe we see some sprouts of an alternative. I don't know. Maybe there are some germs which start, and something that we want to believe in. It's a new exegesis to believe in a new project. Uh, this is what you pointed to, but um, I don't think that that's the explanation for the whole story. So I would like to go even deeper in the past, deeper than the Cold War. For instance, Helmut Schmidt, former chancellor, was a typical representative of attitudes towards Russia in the Cold War period. And maybe also this anti-Americanism is an issue. Anti-Americanism doesn't explain anything. It's only a function of something. There is no anti-Americanism as such. It is always a representation of something. So this uh, left-wing disillusion from injustice, uh, imperial intrusions, or right-wing disillusion concerning the right to hegemony, So what I want to say, what is the point? A very well worked out games of derivates of imperialism, of derivates and mental residues, which seem to be very resistant against imperial way of thinking, and it's also reflected in culture. Could you make an example? Yes, yes, I will come to it. So what I see this incredible affinity to Putin's propaganda in the West. And it's also based on the fact that we have these old reflexes dating back to imperialism. And then there was a, let's say, equal status. Russia and her imperial logics, despite these decades of postmodern work and processing of the debt of, or guilt, then we have decolonization, some regrets, remorses of own imperial past. But in politics, it has already been reflected. But if we come really to the tough things, to areas where it is difficult, where it's complicated, where you see also an intrusion of the archaic, that is the uh, late imperial reflexes of Western powers, they are so strong that they rather believe Russia and they rather understand Putin's logics. I heard, for instance, someone saying about the annexation of Crimea, and a German told me, ah, the poor Putin, what else could he do? There is nothing else left to him only to occupy Crimea. And he even didn't mention this referendum. So you see that such a large and complicated country as uh, Russia uh, demands a lot on uh, governance. And so to achieve unity, you have to re recurse to wars because uh, there is another thing I want to see, say about this post-imperial that would make it more obvious. We have this reflex of derivates that you rather believe uh, 
that the equal thing is in Putin's Russia and it is also then reflected in anti-Americanism because for me the main reason for strong anti-Americanism is not a angry left wing or uh, uh, what I rather see is these resentments of this resistance to the fact that the own imperia were uh, subjugated, pushed away by a new imperium, the US and the other world powers like the Third Reich, etc. With Britain, um, which uh, also uh, taint uh, the political discourse. Um, is, is there, because uh, Britannia would have been uh, the, the one of the examples of your, of your thesis, um, uh, is British politics, for example, saying, uh, okay, we have to speak to Putin directly, forget all these Eastern European countries, so complicated, these countries. Does uh, Ukraine really exist? Does it have, uh, have a right to exist, etc.? These were the questions which were put in, in, Western, uh, in Western societies. So is it, is it coming from these uh, deep sources? The, um, there's a, the, the, the question of how um, imperialism works through current politics is a huge, I agree, it's, it's, it's a big question, uh, but it's also very complicated. So one of the ways in which it runs through current politics is, of course, that in a way the end of the empire wasn't really the end of the empire. It was bringing large populations from the empire into the nation, uh, into the nation state. And that is so, which led to the multicultural effort. And the multicultural effort, it seems to me, um, which is widely supported by the internationalist left, is you know, one of the tasks which we know we have to go through to make the whole of our world a safe world. If we can't live together in a nation, then we can't live together in the world. It's an, it's, it's an effort we need to go through. Now, of course, that leads to huge uh, resentment and resistance. And that typically gets expressed on the, on the right. So you, you talked about Varoufakis and Syriza um, and, the, and, and the Greek left's pro-Putinism. Of course, the real, you know, what really differentiated, uh, uh, you know, the absolute line between Syriza, whatever reasons it might have had for uh, going to, to Moscow, um, uh, from the populist right was this question of multiculturalism, the qu was internationalism, was what is the status of the border in our world? Is it something that's fundamentally constitutive or not? So uh, it seems to me that, the, that, that Putin's propaganda works much more powerfully, much more naturally in a, uh, in, in a, in a, uh, in a fear that's created on the right than in a fear that's created on the left. I, I, you know, I, 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 of course I think that um, uh, uh, Syriza ought to have put a s absolute line at uh, uh, trying to get a check out of Putin. But on the other hand, that was not an ideological position. That was a negotiating position at a time when uh, the appeal being made, uh, as you said, was appe an appeal for democratic sovereignty in a world of globalized markets. And We've got to fix that somehow. The question of do we feel that we control and define our future or is it controlled and defined entirely by the flow of uh, goods and money? So, um, Miroslav, um, uh, Slavomir, excuse me. Uh, Joko spoke about history, deep, deep history. He's going back 100 years. Ago, uh, 100 years. Um, Tony is speaking about present day. So we, I have the impression now that, that, that we have a difficulty to define where it comes from. Comes it from history or is it a, is it a, present, is it a present constellation? 
what what do you say my f feeling uh, is uh, when you allow me to, to to say it in short words is in germany for example the debate about ukraine is was very much a debate of historians um, there are very famous german historians karl schlögel is a very important defender of uh, the ukraine uh, gerd Koenen is another defender of ukraine but there are others like jörg barbarowski who even put in question the right to exist of the Ukraine, or Götz Ali, very famous, very important uh, historical, who is uh, extremely uh, uh, Russia, Russia field. So this debate in Germany is really a debate about history. Uh, your, the position you take um, to Putin is um, uh, very much linked uh, to this uh, Cold War um, uh, experience, to the experience of uh, the detente when politicians, like you said uh, about the empires, addressed Putin or addressed Russia directly. They didn't want to speak to all these Eastern European countries who are so com just so complicated. Uh, they wanted to have their peace with Russia, and uh, there was the same uh, and I think important uh, aspect also that in a way uh, the the victims of uh, the war were seen as Russians. You, you, so you, uh, it's very often said that Russia had 20 million deaths or so in, in, in the war, but the collaborators are always seen as Ukrainian, Lithuanians, etc., etc. Et so there's also a sort of discourse in, in, in the uh, European left wing, um, which, yeah, which is based on a sort of guilt and perhaps a... Uh, uh, um, not so exact uh, image of history. What, what do you say about that? And but with with this aspect also of uh, Tony, which complicates all of present constellations in politics. These are five questions, yeah. um, but um, um, actually, it's it's healthy um, to read the last book of Tim Snyder, The Black Earth, also to 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 look at the. Uh, Russian involvement in the Nazi project. Actually, there are only one. You know, Auschwitz is a very comfortable symbol also for Russians. Actually, it's for everybody. Uh, and it's, of course, only partly. It's like pars pro toto. I mean, most of Holocaust was done before Auschwitz, and most was done face to face, not really in this dehumanized process with makes us a little bit detached from thinking about that we could do it or we could be the victims of it. So it's also for Westerners pretty comfortable. But for Russians, it's very comfortable because this is the only camp that was not built by Russian hands. And also, Russians were, the, as for the Russian nation, like ethnicity, the biggest collaborators of, uh, of Nazis. I'm, I'm saying this not because I hate Russia, but that just to show that you're right, that... Uh, the collective remembrance about it is very different. And that Ukrainians was, were the you know partners or the collaborators, but not Russians. Actually, Germans used to give weapon only to Russians during the Second World War. They trusted only them. Who was uh, who was uh, uh, who, who was able to or who was raised and socialized by Soviet power was a very you know proper. Uh, a candidate for a collaborator or the most proper okay so so this is this is it and of course um and of course you said about those two to 20 million which actually is 20 million but like you know a few million of ukrainians you have it and then so on and like kurt schlegel for those historians kurt schlegel you said is a ukrainophile he was russianophile for entire his life, when you want yeah, to say, yes. when 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 those events in Ukraine happened, he said, "My life, my intellectual life is destroyed. Like I did what I did, and now it's like I feel like shit because like uh, it's it was completely different than I than I thought. You know, other Russian intellectuals, historians, or politicians. Like it was Egon Bar or Helmut Schmidt, both died this year, but one of them said, "Ukrainians are not nation." And all this Ostpolitik that was started by Egon Barr and like, but the vision to it gave Willy Brandt, of course, was a, Ostpolitik meant Russia first, okay, which left no place for Ukrainians and under, also even for Poland, as but they didn't support solidarity. 
they preferred stabilization. We were in pretty similar situations than Ukrainians, all right? We were supported by Christian democratic trade unions. My heart is bleeding, but actually the socialists were not really the first to help to Adam Michnik and other leaders of solidarity. So, um, so, so, so these are the facts, okay? And there are, of course, ha ha hard facts. And, you, and uh, um, Yurko uh, used um, re resentment, uh, which, if you go through Nietzschean uh, writings, is there are many good definitions, but one of it is, uh, or two of it, is that it's like hidden hate, actually. And, this, and the other one, which is much better, is that, you know, in Nietzschean uh, philosophy, you had this division between creat creative power and reactive power, okay? So what was coming back in this eternal return was only what was active before, what added something to the culture, to the society. What was reactive was actually always very conservative. So the difference between, like, anti-American and stupid left, we call them the real left, because the only thing that they do is they divide who is real, who is not. This is the only effort they make. Um, and, uh, and, and the difference is that this left is reactive. They wouldn't have the ratio of their existence without having someone to hate or someone to criticize. And if you'd live this way, if you base your intellectual effort on it, then you really need someone to hate and you're totally dependent on it. So. I think this is a very strong connection also because it's hidden. It's very hard to like open it and, and, and then like to solve it this way. I know it because I'm leftist, so I know my, you know, all my like, faults of my camp are all mistaken, mistakes that you can do. And of course, we're also not free from it, but uh, I don't think there is any different. No one is like uh, vaccinated, no left, no right. Like you can have the same things like on both sides, unfortunately. So uh, this is an interesting point, perhaps to be constructive uh, at the end uh, of our debate. Um, you speak of a reactive and of a creative um, political forces. And uh, so perhaps uh, one of the answers um, to this question put by this need of projection in Western European um, uh, left-wing uh, movements is perhaps that you have to have to, to, you have to get rid of this dream of something beyond and to get creative in a way. Uh, Tony, you you spoke about this dream of uh, something beyond. There has to be something beyond, and for that, um, it's comprehensible that uh, people see. Um, um, not the good things as uh, alternatives. Perhaps it, it is, is, is there uh, something like a religious uh, element in, in, in uh, Western left-wing uh, movements who always needs an alternative? Perhaps we have to um, forget about this need of alternative and create something. What do you say about that? Well, you uh, create a party, uh, okay. um, uh, a bikers party, no? Uh, a cyclist party. Um, <laughs> London is on bikes. But uh, this is the opportunity for me to, 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 to say a few words about what I thought was a, in, it seems to me the right forum to say this about what I thought was a remarkable film, which was Ida. And Ida, the, 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 the Jewish, Polish nun, um, is someone who uh, she rejects uh, she rejects communism represented by her aunt she rejects also um, uh, domestic happiness there's a sort of young extremely attractive jazz player who says to her early 60s come come with me let's go to Gdansk I've got a gig there and and she says, and what, what then? And his reply is, well, I play, you sit in the audience, we get married, we have children, we get a dog. That's what's then. And Ida refuses that, right? It's, 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 it's very, it's tantalizing, it's beautiful, it's, uh, uh, it, uh, it's what every teenager dreams of, maybe. But there are many teenage dreams made of that. But 
Ida says no. Okay, now, where I find the film deeply problematic, deeply troubling, is that her no, 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 to, uh, uh, no to communism, no to the attractions of the private life, makes her retreat from the world. She retreats from the world back to her convent. And it seems to me that that's what we... Now, uh, I think what you're saying is, well, let's get rid of the ideal. Let's get rid of that thing which propels us, which, which, which is the motor of history. Let's get rid of the idea of progress and let all of us, in some sense, become uh, uh, you know, uh, egoistic, cynical uh, individualists. It seems to me that that's exactly no, the that's danger. that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying uh, let's try progress, but let, uh, don't, uh, don't uh, listen to Putin's sirens um, that there is a beyond. But I think that in the notion of progress, there is an ideal, and I think that's deeply constitutive of, uh, of, 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 of the West, of the Enlightenment. It's, it's of where we are. It's, of, it's deeply constitutive of Moses. Moses says there is a promised land, and that is what took the people through the desert. I mean, you, 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 if, if you get rid of that, then it seems to me there's you know, very little which is going to distinguish us from uh, uh, a herd of animals. So, uh, very short last words by Yoko and um, uh, Slavomir. Um, what is to be done to make uh, this energy, which is there, this dream of an alternative, a better energy, in a way? But in very short words, because after that I would like to um, open the debate to the public. Ich frage erst uh, Slavik, ob er die... I am not sure whether we have any ready-made answers concerning your question, Thierry. I do not have the answer, uh, but maybe you will not like my closing remarks and perhaps my colleagues or our colleagues who could say something more optimistic. But what I have to say is that at the moment I am not optimistic at all. And the uh, little we can do is our uh, modest uh, contribution to clarifying the matters, not to enlightening uh, and keep explaining, repeating, and repeating again and pointi pointing to the things. This is the only thing that's possible in this. Uh, period which I consider to be really a, a breaking point. Uh, but uh, I believe uh, we are still only at the beginning of incredibly tremendous changes that are ahead of us. In this connection, I would like to point to another matter. First, how the metonymia was transformed into synonymia. Metonymic notions of Russia and the Soviet Union, uh, it's a synonym, became a synonym. Second, it seems to me that during the last decades, the West uh, was um, getting um, increasingly deeper and deeper, and uh, irrespective of what it did, uh, whether it would intervene, like, for example, in Iraq or Libya, or it will not intervene, as it did not until recently in Syria, uh, whether this will have uh, uh, destructive effects and everything would only get worse. Until recently, the entire energy of the West was only sufficient to maintain the distance from uh, the terrible things going on in the world. Um, more and more resources were devoted to this effort. But I believe that it is not correct to uh, see everything in this light. Uh, the uh, tragedy of Paris and uh, the migrants' flow, refugee flow, 
this uh, shows that uh, this um, inability of the West to keep distance from uh, these um, miseries taking place in the world is uh, weakened. It means that the West no longer has this ability to keep the distance. And uh, here again, I come to the sirens and to their destructive effects. I would like to point to one um, section of Jan Patochka, Patochka's um, heretic essays. He writes that the spiritual substance of Europe uh, was created at the time uh, marked by the struggle between uh, holy empires, uh, Byzantine, Islamic, and uh, European, uh, Western uh, Roman Empire. I believe that uh, it was at that period and in the post-modernist decades when the West wanted to depart from these imperialistic ideas and uh, it um, um, played all its cards uh, being uh, convinced that uh, they can take a new course of action. In other parts of the world, new imperialistic ideas took root in the form of uh, Putin's imperialistic big Russia. Putin uh, uh, rules Russia with the imperialistic ideas, and this uh, imperialistic idea also uh, pervades uh, the Islamic State. I do not want to put them at the same level, and I do not want to allege that these phenomena are uh, identical, but what I want to propose is the following. I believe that this incredible effect of uh, Putin's propaganda also resides in uh, the fact that the West is uh, so uh, disillusioned that they believe that this could be the true alternative. The future uh, should bring something that would liberate us from this neoliberal rigid uh, status. Uh, the West feels to be stimulated by this propaganda into believing that this is something that can be true. And all these uh, postmodernist uh, lies uh, didn't bring anything, and therefore uh, we should um, uh, again uh, uh, put the stake on these uh, archaic ideas. Uh, otherwise, we would not be able to oppose uh, Putin's, uh, to oppose Islamist fundamentalism. But this would be a disaster because the price and everything that would vanish uh, as a result, uh, it, it, that price would be enormous. When we speak about optimist scenarios and about good ideas that um, give us uh, um, positive energy, uh, we have in mind uh, the need to prevent falling back to this initial state. Ako viete, populizmus, extrémna pravica, všetky tieto pohyby... ...good or proper needs, I think. So, I think it's going to be good to look at Putinism as the alternative to globalization. If there are not other alternatives, not other, like, you know, ways of uh, how to deal with this, then the Putinist is the best one, all right? So... Um, so there is a certain need of something, and I think that we should be imperialist of democracy, imperialist of uh, like of different values, and really unite because this is the only way how we can answer to the both globalization and Putinism, only like united Europe, and at, and for sure it's like the the for intellectuals the first thing to do because uh, we can go beyond the you know all those. Uh, um, all those um, emotions that renationalize 
uh, European societies. So this would be my answer. Let's like, what is to be done? Let's be imperialist, you know, but let's build a proper imp empire. Very, very short because you had your last short. word. Yeah. I'm really sorry, but on, on, uh, I mean, you know, in, in both of what you say, we need to recognize the huge paradox of being the anti-imperialist empire, of being the empires of pluralism, right? And in that paradox, I think that there's, one should have a moment of kindness, right? Because if you're, it's a very tight line, and if you're going to maintain the anti-imperialist empire, you have to make sure that you have critics of imperialism inside. Those critics of imperialism are going to work away at that criticism, but you have to be very, very tolerant of your critics of imperialism in order to maintain that paradoxical but position. But actually what I said was not a joke in the sense that like what happened to the 21st century after the atrocities of 20th century is that we are so afraid of ideologies that are really, we are also detached from ideas. Okay, it's better not to be engaged because we can, you know, end up as fanatics or ideologists or something. This is exactly what happens to our anti-imperialism, all right? So I, I have, I, I don't want to come back to the 19th century empires, all right? But I don't want to live in the very weak nation state that cannot do anything and is more and more disappointed with its own political class and then looks at Putin. Okay, we had, uh, I think, a very interesting uh, debate with many aspects and uh, perhaps a little bit nearer to understanding uh, where this uh, uh, Putinophilia comes. But now I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward um, to questions uh, coming uh, from the public. We have, uh, I'd say, some uh, 10 minutes. And um, yes, uh, this lady. No, 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 uh, yes. Thank you uh, for a very interesting, provocative uh, talk. My name is Siobhan Katago from uh, Estonia. It seems you have three songs that Putin is singing, three siren songs. So I'd like to ask if you agree with this. The first song would be the strange bedfellows of the extreme left and right. And what unites them is anti-EU, anti-immigration, anti-homosexual, anti-Islam, and what unites them is um, really on the level of culture, resentment, um, and I think a, a real lack of historical memory about what happened during World War II and afterwards. But the second song, the second group of bedfellows, would be, I think, the intellectuals who make a very old mistake of equating the ideal with the absolute. And you can trace that from Plato all the way to today. And Julian Bender wrote about the treason of the intellectuals. Tony Judd wrote about it. Um, I think that's very dangerous. Right? But that's a different song than the song that populists, left and right, are listening to. And that's a different side of the devil that they're going towards. The third group of bedfellows, though, I don't think he talks about that, and that's the political elite who want gas and want stability. They don't want war, but it's the realpolitik of Russian gas controlling most of Europe. And just think of Gerhard Schröder, and where did he go? Nord Stream. So do you think there's three songs, each seductive, but different, and, and, and particularly for Tony, on the ideal and utopia, it's be careful we don't slide into an absolute here. It's been done many, many times. Uh, was it a question to Tony or? Oh, any of you, anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Yoko, so, uh, but try to be short. Very short. Um, Sie haben völlig recht. Uh, uh, you are absolutely right. And yes, and now it's not by accident that the old Greeks already thought that there is not only one siren, you needed a choir, you always needed a cacophony out of which you built up the illusion of harmony, which was so enchanting, which was so attractive. I accept it. So, so, so I, 
I, I, I like your, your three-part division. And I think that on the ideal and the absolute, I think that we have to be very, uh, you know, of course we have to, uh, you know, the, 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 the danger of the absolute is there. And it seems to me that that is exactly where the uh, power of, uh, the proper power of uh, deconstruction has come from, is in making sure that we find that everywhere, that we find it within ourselves. And it seems to me, therefore, that the, in a sense, the, the uh, you know, getting, uh, accepting that, which tends not to happen in the, uh, uh, in, in, let's say, uh, uh, the, the liberal ideology which says we must stand firm, um, is actually part of the fight we have to find. Okay, are there other questions? Yes, uh, Hi, Haris Vashuj. Uh, it's really a pleasure to, to, to listen to all four of you. And um, I've been thinking about, I mean, so the question would be for uh, everybody. Um, uh, so there is a long history of, of obsession in the West, in, in the political circles and in the media circles, by the strong man. You know, from Gaddafi to Mubarak to uh, Saddam Hussein to Milosevic, you know, there was always something, you know, that appealing in these dictators. Uh, their power, their efficiency, their unpredictability, they are, they are dramatic, they are interesting, you know, they are thriller, uh, they are not predictable. Um, and that's all what we lack in the West, you know, we don't have, you know, this uh, luxury to behave in a such erratic, uh, unpredictable and sexually arousing way, you know, I mean, there is a, a powerful image, a sexual image of, the, of these figures. In Putin's case, it is very much used, you know, in his projecting his image of a sexual macho man, you know, that can do everything. And also, you know, of course, it's coupled with the economic interest that you pointed about uh, uh, gas-dependent uh, Europe on, on Russia and the Russian capital, huge Russian capital in the West. Um, so, um, what uh, what can we do uh, in the Western democracies to make uh, democracy more appealing, more efficient? Uh, both for the Europeans, but also for non-democratic countries, for the countries with, with no, uh, no uh, tradition in democracy, like Islamic countries, or little tradition in democracy, like uh, uh, Balkan countries or uh, Russia. So how to make democracy more sexy? No, uh, Miroslav, it's, it's for you. Listen. Um, if it's true that the economy is globalized and democracy not, then it makes democracy very weaker. And then what works is the selective neg ne negative selection. Who agrees to be a leader or minister of finance or a prime minister if it has very little uh, field of maneuver? If already is uh, dictated by the financial markets or rating agencies or corporations. It's not only stupid anti-globalist language, it's unfortunately really a reality. You have only two countries in the world that can be economically sovereign and it's getting farther and farther, all right? So what worked in Polish democracy uh, is that you have only really cynical politicians, more and more cynical or weak. Okay, because those guys are only, oh, they feel okay in this political field that is very specific, now much different than before. And what works also is a kind of a trade-off between uh, society and leaders. If the society feels very weak, it needs very strong leader. If society feels like self-confident, then it's whatever. Leader is not the biggest problem, okay? And I think what, what, what's going on now is that those societies in, in Europe and in the Western world, they feel very uncomfortable. And this is why the leader is important. I would like to live in a society when leader is the not important thing. So, right? Amir, you, you are trying to building something up uh, with your networks, etc. Uh, for that, I have a second qu question. What is the role uh, of 
the public spheres, you feel that media is, uh, are weaker than uh, 20 years ago. Also, on the other end, you have the internet. So um, please speak about that. But well, you know, I remember when 10 years ago, Adam in Gazeta Wyborcza, that was the strongest thing in Poland you can imagine, stronger than any party or all parties taken together. And, uh, and when Gazeta in Tuesday could publish my essay on three and a half pages, a Tuesday edition, all right? Now I'm not sure if Gazeta has opinion desk section in, in, on Tuesday. And it's not the fault of Gazeta, it's the reality of the market. You know, if Adam will publish his own or even, or, or not even, but even worse, my essays, then it's going to be totally inefficient economically, all right? So what is disappearing from the, like, media is the serious content, okay? Now actually in Polish newspapers, well, now we have one daily, really before you had at least like five. Now there are no journalists who would do the interview with the foreign intellectuals. Or now they don't translate really anything. Like anything, so we established our daily with a very different method based on more fundraising with like big uh, American um, foundations mostly to be able to publish opinions that are really, what to, to compensate what is really lacking, okay? And, and then actually the readership is surprisingly good, like really, really huge. So like, you know, last text uh, uh, that I published about refugees was in few hours re read by 100,000 people, got like 15,000 likes and everything, which is really, of course the situation is specific and so on, but you can already do it with the long text, okay? So it is possible, but not through the market, uh, philosophy, because market works, so who is more brutal, who is more short, who is less based on any strong, you know, ideas, then is lost also in politics. If you sit with a politician and you, have, you really care about something, you really stick to certain ideas and you are not flexible, like you can say today this and tomorrow something completely the opposite, then you, you are, you, then you like, then it's a handicap. Okay, to have an idea, it's a pretty radical idea, actually, now in politics. So, so this is this is pretty problematic. If I would have one minute more to answer, is that Georg Zimmel, the, the one of the founding fathers of sociology, had a nice definition of trust. That trust is something in the same time more and less than the wisdom or certainty. So, uh, it's. Uh, it's something that in the same, and I think what is lacking here, we have, we are overloaded by information differently than a hundred years ago, and we have very little trust to each other, and this is a problem. So how to create the social glue, social bonds, social trust is the main thing, main main mission of what I do. Yes, I, I think this would be a very important follow-up debate, uh, the construction or reconstruction of a perhaps European uh, public sphere, which enables us uh, to discuss. And um, Are there other uh, questions? Okay, Joko? I have something I would like to say, and that is when we look for a solution in desperation, but we have, we are now in intellectual constructivism. It is not so that our rapid thinking or action could influence something or that it would help us to do something. I think that social dynamism is something you shouldn't underestimate today. It is something that is also quite dangerous. I don't want to be a evil prophet, but uh, I think that we have already crossed the point when this evil dynamism could be stopped. I even don't dare to say stopped because it would mean that we can influence them, but look at the political situation in Western Europe. What I see is that every second political 
set, which is behind the uh, those ones in the government, is worse than the those who are worse than those who are in power now. So those who wait behind the current government are worse, and that's bad. I think that we must be very patient and persistent. Yes, uh, dear viewers and listeners, I think you were also very persistent and endured a long discussion, which was quite interesting, uh, very interesting, I would say. I think this Putinophilia is a, this Russophilia are really important issues. It is really a part of Western societies today, and in Western societies we are not thinking much today where these tendencies come from. I think there are a lot of interesting thoughts about it.